So towards the end of the week, it really takes a, a small army to get things from in progress to complete. Uh, during the week, there's really, it's, it's kind of quiet around here. Uh, we're able to get a lot done uh, in preparation. Our processes are really long. So, you know, the typical question that, that uh, I often get from new customers out at the market is, when did you get up to start making all of this, the, the stuff at the, at the farmer's market on the table? And uh, it, it was always kind of a fun thing to answer every time that question comes up, because, uh, you got to ask, well, when is the beginning? So uh, Fridays have really been legendary uh, since, since we bought the bakery. Uh, the original Friday night uh, was certainly not filled with a team of people. Um, keep in mind, a team of people needs somewhere to be supported. So uh, yeah, in the beginning, it was not a team of people in the sense of, of people really willing to part with their time to make bread, but rather a team of family members that came out and uh, and we compelled, you know, strong armed and let them know like, hey, we're not going to sleep tonight at all. So it'd be nice if you could come. Maybe we'll get like an hour at the end of, of sleep. And that was really the deal. So uh, one of the first challenges that we had when Amanda and I took the bakery over was how to make Friday something other than a relationship ending, person sanity ending experience um, every single week over and over again. So I guess it probably, it probably makes sense to start with context. So we're three years into our portion of Proof story and Proof actually dates before us. So we bought Proof at about the three year mark. And at that mark, it was still very much a one person enterprise. There's one baker, uh, there was one, sets of, one set of hands, there's no mixers, and that bakery was in a residential garage. Uh, we are still in a residential garage. Three years ago, that was what we inherited, a, a bakery in a residential garage. There's no mixers, there's no equipment. It was just these four walls in this exact room uh, built for a garage. So there's a big garage door right here. Uh, and now there's a room over there. Uh, and we've built all that kind of ourselves over time. So we're at the end of the week and on the table right now, we're shaping our special. These are all the baguettes that are going out tomorrow. And so these have already been scaled out. Uh, it's our kind of weekly deal right now. We reintroduce baguettes uh, after not making them for a little while. And meanwhile, we are also working with some of our community members that are not here frequently or regularly. Um, and they're getting their hands dirty, um, you know, making bread with us. Uh, the thing about this business, whether, and I think this applies to all local bakeries, whether it's a one-man show or whether there's a small workforce behind the scenes, it's still a community enterprise. So even back when it was a one-man show, I mentioned that you know we had family members coming over and helping with the workload. And we almost immediately needed some sort of help out at the markets. And so on Fridays, actually a lot of the faces that, that will be at the market tomorrow they come out on, at the end of the week and help us out because Friday's workload is n not like any other day. So I'm gonna open up a, a proofer here. Now, this room is, is also a walk-in. So these, these sourdough croissants, which there, there were a few more racks which are already in the process of being baked, but these guys have been getting made for the last couple days. You can see that there's a lot of them in here and, there's no shortcuts about this process. You know, the same processes that we did three years ago, we're doing today. We're just doing more of. And so our process of getting to this point has been all about modifying recipes and formulas and processes so that we can get the most out of our products and 
function in the timelines that we need to. Because the timelines are really strict. These pastries are incredibly sensitive. So you can see that they've been proofing now for the majority of the day. Uh, if I touch them, they're going to start bouncing back at me. They have kind of a jiggly appearance to them. If you look closely, all the layers are, are visible now as they've begun to separate. And so after the course of the whole day, these guys are really close now to going in the oven. And there's a lot of different varieties. All of them have slightly different protocols. So these are a savory uh, pastry on croissant dough with fresh rosemary and sea salt on top. Uh, our kind of best known pastry is this uh, pan au chocolat. These chocolate croissants uh, have custom chocolate that's made locally um, from cocoa beans. Uh, and uh, it's a really, really nice product uh, that's scratch made here, here in the city. Uh, chocolate requires some similar thoughts around processes, like there's a milling process uh, with the stone grinding. Uh, and then that chocolate goes through uh, uh, various stages, uh, ending with tempering, which uh, is the trickiest part. Uh, good tempered chocolate doesn't fall apart very easily, so we have these really nice full chocolate bars, and when they come out of the oven, they're still very nice full chocolate bars. Uh, Non-tempered chocolate just would melt away. Uh, so different varieties in here, already showed you the, the rosemary varieties, but uh, some have already baked, and so I'll walk over and kind of go through some of the other things that are going on here at the end of the week. The baguettes that are being shaped are currently being lined up on these racks and they're going into a shorter proofing period. Uh, right now they're still out at room temperature so they're proofing relatively quickly right now. Uh, depending on our bake cycle we might slow them down in the fridge but we probably will just go straight through and, uh, and get them baked. We like doing that with the baguettes in particular where they go through a colder fermentation at first and then go through an ambient ambient uh, final, final proofing stage. So we have a few uh, sweet treats for our customers this week. Uh, these look familiar if you look up close. Uh, you can st see some of the, some of the layering. Uh, these were very recently just a regular chocolate croissant, but sort of a uh, completely different take on actually utilization of, of leftovers. And so this is traditional bakery practice around the world. In fact, what you think of as an almond croissant is this right here. We actually make uh, two different kinds of almond croissants. We make these as a sweet treat, but our standard almond croissant is scratch made with a, with a filling. It's only baked one time and it's like pastry forward. These type of pastries are uh, cookie forward almost. They're, they're croissant meets cookie. Uh, and so basically the croissant is taken and rehydrated, but it's rehydrated in simple syrup. Uh, then that simple syrup is caramelized when it bakes again. And in between that caramelized pastry is filling. Typically frangipan, that's almond frangipan, but we did a take on the chocolate and we thought chocolate peanut butter would be a really good combination. So we made a peanut frangipan and that's on the inside and on the outside. These get topped with powdered sugar at the end before they get packaged. Uh, this week's pastry special, so we're passing bins of croutons uh, and these still are kind of in between in their processing. So we've cut them up and they now need to be oiled and seasoned. We have a variety of flavors that we make in the croutons. These are all based on that local sourdough and they are awesome in salads or, or in soup. Uh, pretty versatile. Actually, a lot of us just snack on them, to be honest. Uh, they're really good just to snack on. Our pastry special this week, you might have noticed me planting a mulberry um, on, on a different day. Now, these aren't our mulberries yet. That tree still has a little bit of growing to do, but these are local mulberries uh, that we had dropped off uh, 
by a, by a farmer that, that grows these amongst other items. Uh, we made them into a puree. Uh, we combined them with rose water. We felt that the rose water actually brought out a lot of the mulberry flavor uh, without overpowering, but mulberries on their own, they're incredible fresh. And all you wanna do is try to recreate that same fresh flavor when you bite into the berry, uh, when you do anything else with them. The thing is that it never seems to work out that way. Um, the, the like jam flavor of mulberry is not the same thing. So, so far rose water has been the closest that we've ever gotten to getting the essence of mulberry uh, when it's no longer just a whole fresh mulberry off the tree. So last year we made mulberries for the first time in a pastry and actually the first thing we did was just take fresh mulberries and top them on a Danish. Uh, it didn't really pass the market test because mulberries are odd in their appearance. They're like worm, worm-like. They're long uh, and they're not a familiar berry to most people. Uh, yet we want them to be familiar because they're local in origin. They grow here really well. They literally grow in our native soil and our native climate very well. They don't need extra water once the tree's established. So it's a berry we should be eating as Phoenicians much more of. The trees are abundant uh, and they're delicious, but they don't look like anything you've found at the store before. And so we've made them into these really awesome toaster strudel pastries. It's again made from our croissant dough. It's two sheets of our croissant dough stacked on top with the filling in between. And then we're just gonna take these and make a nice icing for the end. Uh, and it's the best Pop-Tart type pastry you've ever had. And you'd never go back to a Pop-Tart, I'd hope, if you try one of those. Uh, so moving into the oven room, um, we are just baking throughout the day today. So over here, there's two ovens working. These ovens are are preparing for more baguettes. Uh, this is a transition period between uh, the bread that's already been baked off today and the rest of the baguettes that, that will be baked off uh, through the rest of the day today. And we still have plenty of baking to do. Meanwhile, we are getting going on uh, processing all the, all the products. So we already have bread that was baked off earlier today that is uh, being put into these micro perforated bags. Each of these bags are then labeled. Uh, and then we slowly start an assembly of all the products into stations. It, we've sort of, we've moved to this level. This is kind of where our expertise ends, to be honest. You know, not too long ago, actually, we were basically taking bread directly from the oven and putting it on uh, on a market rack, like uh, the one that we have right over here, uh, and taking this to the market. And with, uh, with recent events, we've definitely increased our, our packaging uh, generally. Uh, we are moving into uh, delivery and other ways of getting our bread to customers. And so these are micro perforated bags that have the ingredients listed and have all of our contact info listed. Uh, and and while there's, there's an element that's changed, there's something really nice about the world that, that we've sort of departed from and minimal packaging, really minimal waste. Uh, those, were, those were really important values uh, at the markets uh, not that long ago. Now those values have changed and we've sort of changed with them. Uh, one of the big challenges is still working this space. This is, this is a construction project still like we're we don't have any drywall up and if you were standing in this room just a couple months ago it wouldn't have been a room it would have been just studs opened up to the air we broke ground on this just a few months ago and it's my dad that built this uh this garage over the winter it's adjacent to our garage and it's made like an rv garage so that one day uh for a future owner of this place probably never, but maybe if someone else ever owns this place, you know, they won't have to figure out what to do with the old bakery. This will just fold into being an RV garage. Um, so we're slowly getting all the product ready. Uh, as it comes out of the oven, it's getting packaged. 
Uh, there's an intermediary process that happens, which is uh, the slicer. Uh, this thing is the loudest thing in the house, and uh, shoot, when I turn it on, can't hear anything else. But uh, we we just recently acquired this when our other slicer uh, broke down, and so the world that we operate in is a world where we don't know what three or four thousand or five thousand dollar bill hits us next. Uh, I haven't even peeled off the price tag on this guy. Uh, and that was a Friday. So our old slicer goes down and it's the day before the market. We have this community of people that uh, are market hands coming in expecting to slice bread and then what? Uh, so there's a used equipment warehouse in the city that restores equipment, cleans it, gets it all nice, um, guarantees it and resells it. And this is not cheap, but you know, we didn't want to cancel hundreds of orders for sliced bread the next day. So plus sandwich bread really is sliced inherently. Like it's odd to sell a whole loaf of the sandwich style loaf. So we just went out and got a slicer and that's just the world that we operate in. So as the day continues, all of these pack all these pastries are gonna get packaged next. Flour is gonna get packaged. All the products are gonna get individually wrapped. We have uh, English muffins in this room that still need to be uh, sorted into four packs. These are all flipped upside down at the, at the moment. Uh, so we're going to resort them, put them into four packs, sticker them, label them, and again, get them sorted on, these, uh, on the rack behind. So as the day continues, it's going to transition more into really an assembly line. We're going to start moving things around this room and, and creating stations. Uh, and as we sort of reconvene, as the ovens turn off, it's going to be everybody at different stations putting together orders that are then going to go out and be loaded onto the truck this evening. Uh, meanwhile, beyond orders, we also have to get all the farmers markets and all of our wholesale orders ready. So it's a big day. Uh, the oven goes all day long into the evening. Every station is just operating and going. And it's basically a culmination of the entire week worth of preparation all coming together at the right interval today. So keep in mind that these are all living products through, through the time that they reach terminal temperature in the oven. And so when we're, when we're talking about the, the dough that's on these racks, it's got a timer attached to it. There's a lot of bread and there's only so much oven space all of these loaves have to make it into that room at the right cadence around all of the other items that are being baked. Uh, if we lose the time by even 30 minutes uh, on one end, the loaves will all fall flat. Or if we go a little too early, they're going to uh, be dense and sort of undesirable um, in, in their underproof form. Uh, it's really a delicate balancing act that we're doing all day. So we're keeping an eye on these, uh, this proofer especially. This room has this high humidity going on and, uh, and, and a higher temperature. And so this is a walk-in when we need it to be. This is a heavily insulated room. Uh, the AC unit is hooked up to this device called a CoolBot, which makes the AC unit blow colder. Uh, we keep this room in the low 40s, which in Celsius, about five degrees Celsius, um, when it's cool. And then we heat it up to 80 degrees, and I don't know what that is in Celsius, uh, but it's at 80 degrees and high humidity that all of these products kind of come to life. Uh, the sourdough croissant really almost starts and ends here. We didn't always have this room. In fact, this used to be a concrete ledge and there used to be closets over there for the original garage. We took those out. If you go through our social media, if you go far enough, you're going to see a photo of me sledgehammering 
uh, the early garage uh, and taking out the taking out the closets. Uh, when we took out those closets, we substituted them for refrigerators, uh, much like this one that we still have. This is actually one of three refrigerators that we had as we sort of accumulated used refrigeration equipment as we sort of made more and more pastries every week and more and more bread every week. And then this refrigerator, along with two others, was on top of this concrete ledge, which was around the whole garage. And what was unfortunate was not only was it a tripping hazard, uh, but we lost the square footage of that step. So actually right here was that step. And it was around the entire perimeter of the garage. So our 500 square foot bakery really in effect was 400 square feet or a little less because you couldn't really put much on that ledge. A lot of the equipment didn't fit on the ledge. You couldn't roll anything up and down. You think about that as a small thing. And at first it was a small thing when it was just me in the garage, no mixers, no equipment. It certainly wasn't a priority. But at a certain point, it became this huge pain point of we can't use this very necessary square footage. So it's actually last summer that the first step was just taking this piece of ledge out as we joined these two rooms because the first bit of building that we did was my dad building this oven room that uh, is is in the background right now where, where we bake everything. This was, you would have not been looking at me right now where you are right now is is outside of the house and I'm inside of the old garage and this is an, this is an exterior wall that we're looking at. So there was a period in time where this wall came out, it was reinforced on top, and this was all done by us, by our family members. Uh, and just kind of a crazy story. None of this really looks the same if you go back three years. If you go back two years, it doesn't look the same. If you go back one year, it doesn't look the same. And frankly, if you go back six months, it doesn't look the same. If you look into this cor corridor, you actually see in the background a bathroom. We didn't have one anywhere near the garage at the beginning. So when we first started, you know, I'd be baking in here and you, know, you, you got to go to the restroom once in a while. And at the time, we didn't have the same processes in place. I've mentioned before uh, on when we were working on sourdough together that there's really kind of two ways of handling bread. Uh, a lot of times people use flour as kind of the byproduct on the table. They're dusting the dough with flour. They're dusting the table with flour. They're dusting everything with flour. Well, when you use flour, it ends up on the ground and you can sweep every 15 minutes and there's still flour that's accumulating as you're going. Uh, so. In the previous era, when we were using flour, we would track it through the house, just going to the bathroom. So one of the first things we did was we closed a hallway in, in our house. This used to be able to stare right through the whole house, and you would have been looking at, looking at bedrooms uh, right now, looking at the entryway to bedrooms on the other side. But now it's a bathroom. So we closed the little hallway, we brought plumbing in, we brought drainage in, did all the research, did all the permitting, this is all above the books type work. Uh, and it, it took a lot of effort. Uh, so we're slowly getting kind of a space that works. A space is evolving over time and Fridays have been the stress point. So everything we do to try to improve our dynamics here, we, we test them against Friday and see if we can pass. So uh, there's definitely challenges to trying to do this from a house garage uh, and the only people kind of crazy enough to pull it off would probably be people that have a willingness to do more than just bake bread. Uh, it's probably far easier to get a lease and work with contractors and get things built up, but that's expensive. And frankly, the, the reason we're here, because a lot of people ask us, well, why are we still here at, at this point, is that 
We still haven't reached a production level, believe it or not, where going into a retail space is safe from a business standpoint. Uh, wherever you are uh, watching this, you probably have your favorite uh, food-based businesses that you support. You might have favorite restaurants that you enjoy, uh, favorite bakeries, whatever it is in your city. And you might have also noticed that over time, some of them have disappeared. It turns out that it's really, really difficult to make the numbers work in food. And uh, one of the difficulties that exists right at the, at the entry is you're trying to figure out how to manage the costs that you encounter as a business. You need equipment. You have to start somewhere. So you likely don't have a whole lot when you're starting it. Otherwise, why would you do something as hard as making food if you already have, you know, a lot of funds and, you know, this is not the type of thing that people just go into uh, for no reason. There's passion and then there's hard work and those, you know, the intersection of that is, you know, working in food. So when you're starting, typically there's a lot that we need. So, you know, this space had very little. We invested into all of that. Uh, and those investments really took away any ability to have anything left over at the end of the day as we were going. We're, you know, buying these forms. It, each one of these forms is, is a $13 investment. There's, there's no way around it. And we have hundreds of these things lying around that we've had to accumulate over time, slowly but surely, as needed. And so the reason that this works for us is because there is no one else other than us as the owners of the home here who has financial expectations of us today, nor a year ago, nor two years ago. So rather than paying a landlord, we're putting dollars back into the business. And as a result, we're able to make better products. We're able to make a little bit more of them. And we're able to actually get to the point that we can support ourselves and a small community. The, other side of the food industry is often aggressively positioned for landlords to always make their money because you have to pay for the spot that you're in regardless of whether people are coming in the door or not. However, the owner operators that are slaving away, and trust me, I slave away, so I relate completely, they're lucky if they can pay the bill for the place that they're in the next month. Oftentimes they have collateral loans and the collateral is their home. So not only do they not have their food-based business in a garage setting that they're able to improve at will, but they also have their home still up for grabs if they can't make that rent obligation. It's a really scary dynamic. We didn't want that. It, frankly, we could do other things and we wouldn't have done this if we couldn't have grown it organically and sustainably, which unfortunately right now, the dynamic of the food industry doesn't really allow for a lot of businesses to start and grow sustainably to the point that they can stand on their own two feet without borrowing in a very risky way. Uh, I wouldn't invest in a brand new food business, so I don't blame a a uh, landlord that is skeptical over whether it's going to be able to pay the bills. At the same time, on the flip side, I wouldn't take that loan uh, based on the speculation of whether my food will sell or not. It's such a hard thing to get off the ground. And some of it's just luck, to be honest. Like, there's so many people that make good food and there's no market at the end for them for one reason or another. We're extremely fortunate that we found a community, but we found our community slowly and sustainably at the markets in, in the most raw uh, sense possible. And uh, they're still around, still buying from us every, every day, following along this kind of crazy story of turning four walls and a couple outlets and ledges and, and closets into something that looks a lot more like a bakery over time. So it's not the prettiest thing, but it's getting prettier by the day. It's getting prettier by the week. And it will continue to get prettier over time. We will move parts of our business from here. Uh, likely Friday will move heavily off site eventually because 
it's outgrowing what what's normal for a residential space right now. And we recognize that, but we're fortunate to be in a position where we can move gradually as time allows. Um, and so I really can't say enough about that. I really hope that the future is one that allows more people to leverage the stuff they already have, like their empty garages, their empty yards, their empty closets, and turn those into really creative enterprises that benefit their communities. Uh, I think a lot of people more, would be more happy that way, uh, working on things they really want to work on. Uh, certainly we are. So.